Hello. Thanks for listening to today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu City, Arizona. We are on our Limitless series, and today's message is called The Risk. We are focusing on Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. The Life Notes are available from our website at calvaryaz.com forward slash life notes. So download your Life Notes and grab your Bible now. Here is Pastor Chad Garrison. I'm going to invite you to take a seat and to grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to Nehemiah chapter 2. The book of Nehemiah chapter 2 is our text And if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's perfectly fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 468. Page 468, you will find Nehemiah chapter 2 right there. You'll be able to follow along with us. Uh, and, And as always, if you're here in the room and you don't have a Bible and you want one, take one of those with you. We want you to have God's Word and read God's Word. If you're joining us online, we want you to have a Bible. And if you don't have one and want one, message the service host or just uh, email us at calvaryaz.com. We will be glad to get you a Bible because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, uh, I just want to echo what Pastor Pete said about Next Steps classes. I would love for you to sign up because every single one of us has a next step to take in following Jesus. And so, if you haven't taken intro, if you're new here or you've just been coming for 20 years and not taking intro, we'd love for you to take intro. Just officially find out who we are and what we're all about. If you're like, hey, I'd really like to learn how to grow and feed myself spiritually, grow class. If you want to know how we serve and why we serve our community, take serve. And if you're like, what does it mean to be in leadership at Calvary? Uh, then sign up for that one. Although lead class starts three o'clock Sunday uh, afternoon. And I teach that one because I need three times as much time as everyone else. Uh, but uh, uh, we just would love for you to take that next step. And, uh, and I'm always, uh, uh, you know, pleading with people, whatever step that is, go ahead and sign up and and do that. Hey, what is the riskiest thing that you have ever done? What is the riskiest thing you have ever done? Uh, Don't tell me, tell your neighbor, you got like 10 seconds, tell each other, see who's done the risky thing. What's the riskiest thing you've done? Okay, some of you are like, I play it safe all the time. I've never done anything risky. Some of you are confessing right now, and that's great. You're like... The person sitting next to you is like appalled, shocked. All right, some of you are having way too much fun with this. Some of you are wanting to brag, aren't you? I can see it. So uh, how, many, how many adrenaline junkies are in the room? Go ahead, can, go ahead and confess. Okay, there's a good number of you. Uh, we're a distinct minority, and I say we because uh, I've bungee jumped. Anybody bungee jumped with me in here? Okay. So, uh, not a lot of you. Okay. Uh, uh, I've gone wild caving. Anybody uh, done the the whole, there's a few hands like, yeah, I was dumb enough to do that too. Uh, All right. How about, uh, we live on Lake Havasu. How many of you have cliff jumped in the lake? All right. A lot more of you. See, that's a little bit more adrenaline junkie. You know, Copper Canyon and other places, uh, always with clothes on. So, it's all good. Uh, (laughs) But you know, the riskiest thing that uh, I've ever done, in retrospect, uh, was taking uh, my oldest daughter, Amber, when she was 12 years old, to Nigeria on a mission trip. Uh, Nigeria is one of those places where the State Department warns you not to go. Uh, Now, you know, I say retrospect because it was an amazing trip. God changed her life. Uh, and, and actually, God changed the life of Calvary uh, through that trip. And, and so it was all worth it. But the thing is, we've all taken risks. Whether you consider them risks or not, you've taken risks, you bought a house, you've changed jobs, you started a business, you got married. <laughs> Look, all of those involve risks, right? Now, uh, the riskiest thing all of us do, and we don't even think about it in terms of being risk, risky, you know what that is? Driving, driving. Yeah. yeah. Driving, it's the, it's the, it, that's the riskiest thing that we do. So. Uh, Now, today, as we continue our Limitless series, uh, we're talking about risk. And specifically, we're talking about Nehemiah's risky request. Nehemiah's risky request. Okay, uh, chapter 2. Now, if you missed last week, so uh, let me just catch you up. Nehemiah is in the Persian Empire. He was born in the Persian Empire uh, as a Jew in exile. And uh, he's the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. And as cupbearer, he is responsible to make sure the food's not poisoned. And so he is trusted. He's respected. Uh, he's a valued employee, if you want to call it that, as an employee 
of the king who has the greatest empire on the face of the earth at the time. So it picks up, in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, why is your face sad, seeing that you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone, and will, when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given, to me, given me to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. Uh, now, Nehemiah had a burden. The burden was to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. That's what he wanted to do. He had a place of privilege, a position, and, uh, and as cupbearer of the king, he had access to the king. But I want you to understand what Nehemiah risked. In his request, Nehemiah risked his comfort, his position, and his life. He risked his comfort, his position, and his life. I mean, look, he lived in the palace. He was in the lap of luxury. Now, he wasn't the guy in charge, but he was living off the benefits of being the next to and around the guy in charge. So he's living in the palace. He was trusted by the king. He, he was wealthy, I mean, considering all things. And he had a cushy, if somewhat dangerous, job. Okay, but I mean, he, you know, how would you like it if your job was to taste wine and eat food? I mean, it kind of sounds like the perfect job for a lot of us, right? You're like going, I signed me up for that. I'm ready to go. But, but see, because he was broken over Jerusalem, because he was, you know, grieving for the people of Judah, he put that all at risk. He put his position at risk. He put his wealth at risk. He, he put his life at risk. He showed up to work looking different. Why do you look different? Because he'd been fasting and praying all these days and he decided not to gussy himself up and cover it all up. So, you know, this is a guy who really honestly is supposed to be invisible. He's supposed to be there at the king's beck and call, but he's not supposed to draw attention to himself. He's not supposed to be noticed. He's just supposed to be there blending into the background until the king needs wine. So that's his job. And, and, and the king, without asking a single question, could have demoted him. Yep, you're not the cupbearer anymore. You got to go clean toilets. Okay? Could have demoted him. He could have put him in prison. Well, you're bringing me down. Uh, I don't like that. Go to jail. He could have sent him to work in a, in a mine someplace, hard labor. Could have just had him executed. Because he's king. He doesn't have to give a reason. He can just say, oh, you displeased me, so I'm going to kill you. See, Artaxerxes was the single most powerful man in the world, and yet Nehemiah trusted God and took the risk. He took the risk. And God blessed Nehemiah. I mean, this is, this is the amazing thing. I mean, it's a very short passage, but the king says, okay, so what do you want to do? You want to go rebuild, rebuild the walls? Oh, okay, what do you need? How much time do you need? So obviously the king liked him. How much time do you need? I want you to come back. I want you to serve me again. Okay, and then Nehemiah goes, well, since you're going to let me go, can I have a bunch of money and a bunch of resources and some troops? Right? I mean, he just asked for it all, and God gave him all of it. I mean, it was kind of like the, the trifecta of prayer requests. He got the permission to go, he got protection for going, and he got provision for when he got there. See, the whole story of Nehemiah only happens, the project is only completed because Nehemiah, when he could have been comfortable, took the risk. He took the risk. 
Um, now let me just talk to you about Calvary's request. Now, it might be a little bit risky, but it doesn't really feel like it when you look at Nehemiah's story. Uh, look, we've talked about this before. Uh, we're running out of space. It's really obvious if you come at 9.30, and some of you are 9.30 refugees that have moved to Saturday night, and I appreciate that. Uh, and if you're, you know, some of you are like, is it really crowded? I'm gonna show up, please don't. Uh, 9.30 is out of space. We're, we're less crowded, but if you look around this room right now, uh, there's not uh, a ton of empty spaces. So, uh, and 11 o'clock is about like uh, this service. Parker is soon to get in their space. Hopefully by the 1st of March, they'll be occupying their space. They'll have to go to two services immediately. So we need space. We need space for worship. We need space for life groups. We need space for children, for students, for Celebrate Recovery, for uh, Calvary Christian Academy. We need, we need space. So our plan is to build a mezzanine in here, fancy word for balcony, so we can expand seating, get about 40% more seating than we have right now, uh, so that we can uh, grow by about 50% larger without having to add any services. Uh, and then we wanna build a multi-purpose building right out this, this way, right in this, you know, the parking lot, the good parking right now, sorry. We wanna build a building right there, and, and it's gonna be a multi-purpose building. It's gonna be for our children, our students, our life groups, our celebrate recovery, all those things we mentioned, plus offices for staff, uh, and, uh, and we wanna do all that debt-free over the next five, six years. So that's, that's uh, so here's the request. That's the plan, here's the request. By the way, I have two requests. Two requests. Uh, first one is, is about as simple as it gets, and that is attend to dinner. You heard Pastor Pete talk about the limitless dinners, already about a third full. Uh, I would love for you to come to a dinner, February 15th, 16th, 18th, 19th, or 20th. We got five dinners, five nights. Uh, all of them start at six, except Sunday afternoon. We're starting at four, uh, for those of you who are afraid of the dark. And uh, wait, that's nobody here in this room, is it? Because you guys are coming at night anyway. Uh, and, and here's the thing, we just, the dinner is free. You can come to dinner, I'm buying you dinner, but we're inviting you to participate in the building program that I just talked about. Uh, by the way, is that transparent enough? You know, because when the king said, what do you want? Uh, I'm just telling you up front. So we're gonna invite you to participate. And, and here's the thing, I want everyone to attend a dinner even though we don't have room for everyone. I want us to have a problem of trying to figure out how to put more people in. So just understand, if you're here, you're invited. If you're joining us online, you're invited. We want you to come and, and attend. But we especially want you to attend if you believe in the mission of Calvary, to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. We want you to attend if you support the ministry of life change. We want you to attend if you strongly desire to see your friends, your family, your neighbors come to that life-changing relationship with Jesus. We want you to attend if you really want to make a generational difference in Lake Havasu City and Parker. So, request number one, attend a dinner. Request number two, ask God what he wants you to do. Just ask God what he wants you to do. Ask God if he wants you to participate. Ask God what he wants you to do with his resources. Just ask God and then do what he says. Those are our requests. Attend a dinner and ask God what he wants you to do. Is that fair? Yes. You guys seem like really uninterested right now. Well, I'm gonna stand him up for dinner, so the rest of it's not necessary. Hey, uh, just so you guys know, I've, I've really been praying and asking God to provide the, uh, you know, $7 million, because then we pay for all that and we're debt free. And, and I've been asking God, and God answered me. And it surprised me, because he said to me, uh, yeah, Chad, uh, I'll, I'm gonna, I got good news and bad news for you in this request. And I was like, okay, God, what's the good news? And he said, hey, I just want you to know, I have already given Calvary the money. And I just did the happy dance, and I was rejoicing, and I was celebrating. I was like, that is so great, God. I trust you, I believe you. And I go, oh, by the way, what's the bad news? He says, it's in the members' bank accounts. So uh, that's Calvary's request. Uh, now I want to offer you an invitation to risk. An invitation to risk. See, last week we challenged you to really ask God to change your life. We challenged you to bring your burden 
to God. I mean, Nehemiah was burdened for the, the wall of Jerusalem and he took that burden to God and he took that risk uh, of a request. And, and so we challenged you. And a lot of you have stepped into that challenge. A lot of you have said, yeah, well, you know what? We're praying, we're reading, we're fasting. I mean, I've heard people, uh, uh, you know, tell me that they've committed to fast from sweets, from social media, from soft drinks, from coffee, from wine, from games on their phone, to, uh, to eating after six o'clock, uh, to lunches, to alcohol, lots of different things. So we invited you to, make, you know, to, to step into prayer and fasting, to confession and repentance, to really ask God to meet your burden that's in your heart for how you want God to change your life. So today, we're inviting you to take some risky steps. Just like Nehemiah took a risk, we're gonna ask you to take a risk. It's not as risky as Nehemiah, okay? Because you're not gonna lose your life over this. But it's definitely challenge, challenging. So the first thing we're gonna uh, invite you to risk is to embrace transparent living. Embrace transparent living. Now, if you don't know, if you're new here, transparent living is one of Calvary's core values. Okay, this is something that we hold near and dear. We believe that God desires us to be real, open, and honest about who we are and allow others to do the same. Okay, I mean, that's what transparent living is about. It's about being real, open, and honest about who you are and give other people the same privilege that you have. We're gonna be real, open, and honest. We want you to be real, open, and honest. That's, that's kind of our desire. So we're a place that travels in transparent living. Uh, see, the reality is Jesus came to set us free. Okay, and part of that freedom is freedom from pride and shame that makes us try to look better than we are. All right, how many, how, how many of you, back when you were younger, whatever younger is, uh, going to church, you were supposed to put on your Sunday best? How many of you, remember those days? Okay, yeah. Look, as a kid, I hated ties. As an adult, I still do. Uh, so I'm just, just saying, I did it. I did it for a long time here as pastor. Uh, but it, uh, it was all about trying to make us look better than we are. And I grew up in churches that preached freedom in Jesus and then lived in fear of discovery. See, they didn't want people to know. They didn't want people to know who they really were, what I really struggle with. Well, if you knew me, then you'd reject me. And so all this energy was spent on people going, okay, you know, we're gonna smile, we're gonna say everything's fine, but we're not gonna let anybody know that we're struggling. We're not gonna let anybody know that we failed. We're not gonna let anybody know how difficult our life is because then they might, you know, reject us. And so everybody puts on a happy face and everybody pretends that they're doing well when they're dying on the inside and nobody actually finds the freedom in Christ because they're too busy trying to make sure that nobody discovers who they are. See, our secrets make us sick. Okay, our secrets make us sick. And when we try to look better than we actually are, you know what that makes us? Hypocrites, right? If we try to look like we've got it all together, we don't have it all together. And we're trying to look like we're, we're holier than other people. We're not really holier than other people. And we try to make it look like we've, you know, we've accomplished something and we've reached a, a status in life where we're no longer tempted. You know, um, I, I used to be tempted. No. You know, that's real time temptation, right? Jesus was tempted. You're going to be tempted. He passed. You're going to fail more often than, than, uh, than that. But, but here's the thing. We're still tempted. It's not a past tense kind of thing. God didn't suddenly just make us all holy. And yet, a lot of times in church, we get caught up in that, I gotta look better than I am. And that feeds into our sickness because it's a secret. And, uh, and ultimately, that leads us to the place where we're striving for the approval of people rather than the approval of God. Do you know the Apostle Paul in Galatians 1.10 said, am I now trying to please men or Christ? If I'm trying to please men, I am no longer a servant of Jesus. Wow. And yet, church after church after church is filled with people who are looking for approval from people. See, here's a reality. Hope this makes your night. I know you're a mess. Okay? 
doesn't bother me a bit. You know why? Because I know I'm a mess. Uh, look, that, it's, it's theological, it's biblical. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All means? Yeah, that means you're sitting next to a sinner. There's sinners behind you. There's sinners in front of you. There's sinners all around you. Now, I don't know if you're the worst of them or not. Doesn't really matter because uh, all of our sin condemns us to hell. Any of our sin condemns us to hell. But see, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, that's the good news of the gospel, that while we're sinners who deserve condemnation, God sent Jesus into this world to rescue us from our sin, to forgive us from our sin, and to set us free. Man, we get half of that right so often. So often. See, God loves us, and he forgives us, and he heals us when we confess. Um, so forgiveness is found in confession to God. So 1 John 1, 9 the apostle says, if we confess our sin, God is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and purify us of all unrighteousness. Isn't that an awesome promise? By the way, the verse right before that says, if we say we have no sin, then we're a liar and the truth is not in us. Okay, so that's why I say, look guys, I know you're sinners, it's all, it's all good. Because we're all sinners, and that's good. Because forgiveness is there, and all you have to do, is you don't have to ask me for forgiveness, you just have to ask God for forgiveness, and he will forgive you of all your sin. And by the way, every church I was in taught that verse, loved that verse, proclaimed that verse, and encouraged people in that verse. That was great. That is forgiveness. But freedom is also found in confession to others. Because just like, 1 John 1, 9, James 5, 16 says, confess your sins one to another and pray for each other that you may be healed. So you know what happens in a lot of churches? They get the first part right and everybody is forgiven and nobody is healed because everybody's keeping secrets. And what happens is then you have a sick, twisted, dysfunctional body of Christ that's trying to represent Jesus, but can't do it because everybody's bursting on the inside with all the stuff they don't want to get out and they're trying to live under a cloak of darkness and act like a bunch of ninjas. Now, I mean, that's what, that's what we're doing. And, and, and yet we don't have any freedom because, um, you know, we're living forgiven and fearful. What if they find out? So what we're trying to do here at Calvary is just go, hey, we don't care. We know you're a mess. We know you've got secrets. We don't care. And if you just step into the light and, and you get comfortable uh, saying, hey, you know, here's how I've screwed up. Here's how God's redeemed that. Because what we're really interested in is not how you've screwed up, but how God has redeemed it. See, that's where freedom is found. When you're no longer ashamed of your past, when you're no longer feeling guilty because of what you have done, because every single one of us is disqualified by our actions. Everyone. I don't care how good you are or how good you think you are. By the way, if you think you're good, you're not. So, uh, hey, look, just get over it. And, and, and step into that freedom and go, okay, God, I not only want you to forgive me of my sins, I want you to set me free from that fear of discovery. So, uh, confession and transparency is risky, but it's worth it. Now, if you don't believe me, I got a story that you should listen to. Hi, Calvary. My name is Patrick. I'm your recovery pastor here. Um, you know, I'm a professional hider. I learned at a young age, um, as, as I grew up in a pastor's home in, in the South, that uh, what people expected on the outside and uh, what life was really like weren't always the same thing. And you know, um, I became really good at portraying the image that people wanted to see. So um, I did that for about 30 years. And uh, I came to Calvary and I began to continue to do the same thing that I'd done my entire life. I hid, I uh, concealed my problems. I pretended like I had everything together. I did this in my professional life. I did this in my relationships. I did this in my marriage. And you know, eventually it caught up with me. I found myself in the summer of 2019 at rock bottom. I was hopeless. I was uh, living without purpose. Um, I had a career that I didn't care about. I had uh, a marriage that I thought was broken and uh, I really uh, had no purpose in living. In fact, I was actually suicidal. Um, 
I found myself at the pit of, uh, of addiction. I was using substances to numb the pain of the guilt that I had from, uh, from living a life of infidelity and uh, a decades long pornography addiction. And you know, this is, uh, this is something that a lot of people struggle with, I think, and don't have the courage to talk about. But I wanna tell you that I know what it's like to sit and pretend like you have everything together. So if that's you, I want you to know you're not alone. You know, for me, what it took was stepping out of that denial and stepping out of that duplicitous living and, and, and encountering the pain that comes with revealing um, that sinful lifestyle. For me, it came, uh, it, it came through Celebrate Recovery. I was uh, recommended by a good friend to go and try, and, and I said, well, you know, I have nothing else to lose, so I might as well go do it. So I went to Celebrate Recovery for three weeks. The third week, I knew that I had to make a change. I knew that I had to step out of denial. I knew that I had to reveal everything um, to my wife that I had been doing for, for, for so many years. I knew that I had to, uh, to stop pretending to be the Christian that I wasn't because I had decided that um, no matter what the outcome was, I was willing to lose everything to gain purpose and to gain a relationship with God. Since that was the case, I didn't really care what the outcome was. I knew that I had to change and I knew that God was calling me to live for Him. So I chose to do that. So if that's you today, can I just encourage you to take the risk and trust God? Let me tell you what He's done in my life since I decided to take that risk. He's totally restored my marriage. My relationship with my wife is so much better than I ever thought it could be. My marriage is filled with so much more purpose than I ever thought was possible. My relationship with my kids is totally restored. You know, we still have our issues, but they look up to me as a father and I get to show them how to live a life that, that, that follows Christ. I get to shepherd them in, uh, in, in how they should live their lives according to what the Bible says. I also have the opportunity now to, uh, to do ministry here at Calvary as your recovery pastor. I get to shepherd the incredible ministry that gave me hope and purpose and a framework to fix my issues. So every Monday night at 6.30, you'll see me here at Celebrate Recovery, uh, where you ought to be too. And I think most importantly, because I decided to trust God with my life, because I decided to take that risk and step out of denial and stop living two different lives. God has given me a life that is so much better than any one I could have ever manufactured myself. You see, living life for Him and for His purpose is so much more rewarding. And it's simply because I decided to stop living for myself and to start trusting God. All right, so we're taking the risk. We're inviting you to take the risk of transparent living. And we're going to invite you to take the risk and ask for help. Ask for help. 1 Corinthians 12, 26. Uh, the, 1 Corinthians 12 is a passage all about the body of Christ. And Paul talks about, the Apostle Paul talks about the body and how we're all part of the body and we're all gifted differently and we're all needing each other. And, and verse 26 says, if one member suffers, all suffer together. And, and if one member is honored, all rejoice together. The body of Christ is meant to help each other, not condemn each other. Isn't that a novel thought? Church is a place where you are helped and you are welcomed, not condemned, not judged by other people who are just as sinful as you are. So ask for help. We're all sinners, so we all need help. B uh, by the way, confessing Jesus is asking for help. So if you're a follower of Jesus, if you come to that place where you've said, uh, I believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and I believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sins and was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then you've already asked Jesus to help you. By the way, you can't be a Christian unless you ask Jesus to help you. That's, that's the whole definition of becoming a follower. Jesus, I can't save myself. I need you to do it for me. Will you do that? And if you, ha by the way, if you're here and you haven't done that, we would love to talk to you about how Jesus can change your life completely. Uh, I don't know if you picked up on Patrick's story, but that's when he surrendered to Jesus 
is when God cha- turned his life around. So when we do that, we experience forgiveness and salvation when we ask Jesus to help us because we can't save ourselves. We can't do this work ourselves. But it doesn't stop there. Because we're part of a body, because we're part of a unit, because we're part of a team, we are created for community and we need to help each other. We need to help others and we need others to help us. We need help to live the Christian life. By the way, that's why I, we as a church and I as a pastor, I'm a huge proponent of life groups because that's what life groups are designed to do. They're designed to help you follow Jesus. Uh, Proverbs 13, 20 puts it perfectly. The one who walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of idiots, my word, suffers harm. Okay? (laughs) Fools is the word, but I think I like idiots better because we've all got those idiot friends. And if you surround yourself with idiot friends, your life is going to crash and burn. But if you surround yourself with people who are wise, who love Jesus, your life is going to prosper. And sometimes we just need help to get unstuck. And your friends who love Jesus are going to be your spiritual tow truck. I know all about tow trucks. Merle and I were newly married less than a year. We took a group of students on a mission trip up to Long Beach, Washington. Anybody ever been to Long Beach, Washington? Yeah, it's beautiful. It's, it's nice in the summer. I don't want to be there in the winter. But, um, but we're up there, and they, and they said to us, and, you know, and I'm, I was kind of an idiot then because uh, I was young, uh, and uh, they said, hey, the beach is a highway. You can drive on the beach. And I had a church van. I thought, let's go driving on the beach. <laughs> what they didn't tell me was there are accesses for ordinary cars, and then there's accesses for four-wheel drive, and I chose the four-wheel drive access. And guess what I did? I buried that thing up to the axles. Yeah. I got stuck. I had to call a tow truck. I irritated my wife because she warned me about doing that. Uh, so... Some of us, some of us have buried our lives up to the axles. And you're sitting there trying to dig yourself out and you can't do it and you need to ask for help. But you don't want anyone to know that you actually need help. But see, that's the risk. You need to ask for help. Uh, And and it's okay because we all need help. Uh, it might be counseling. We've got pastoral counseling available at Calvary. You can call up and make an appointment and talk to, uh, we have several counselors and we have several pastors who are available to make appointments with you. Look, it may not be me because I don't have a lot of appointments available, but uh, it's somebody who loves Jesus and can offer biblical wisdom. We also partner with the counselors in this town who have a relationship with Jesus and we can refer you out to them. Just call the office uh, if that's something that you need. Uh, Patrick already mentioned it, but Monday night, 6.30 in this room, we have this ministry called Celebrate Recovery. You guys might notice there's some fans in the room uh, of Celebrate Recovery. But by the way, Celebrate Recovery is open to everyone. Did you catch Patrick's thing about you need to be there? Uh, so it, it was for everyone. And people are like, well, I don't, I don't have an addiction to a chemical. Less than half of the people have addiction to chemical addiction issues that come to celebrate recovery. It is for everyone who's messed up. Oh, wait, that's all of us. So there you are. Um, you know, uh, if you're stuck in, in grief, we have a ministry called Grief Share. It meets on Tuesday nights at 530 here at Sweetwater. Uh, maybe you're just financially stuck. We have a benevolence ministry and there's an online application at calvaryaz.com slash backslash help. And and there's an online application. You can fill out and and say, hey, I need some help. And maybe you're just here and you're at that place where you go, hey, I need someone to pray for me right now. Our prayer team is here and will be here after the service to intercede for you and, and to talk with you. You see, take the risk. Embrace transparent living Ask for help. After all, Nehemiah risked everything to accomplish his task, his burden. So today, what will you do? What will you risk to see God work in your life? Let's pray together. Father, we need you. And thankfully, you are there to help us. But we really can't live this life alone. You didn't design us to live this life alone. You designed us to be part of the body of Christ and and to need one another. So help us to repent of the pride and the shame and embrace that transparent living that you're calling us to, to find forgiveness, to find healing, to find health, to find life. 
to find f- freedom that only you can give. So God, just take away the fear and let us live in faith and freedom. That's our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, Pastor Chad challenged us to embrace transparent living. This week, think about ways to be more transparent, especially if you relate to Patrick, who had lived a secret double life. Once he chose to be honest, he experienced grace and realized a more fulfilling life through reliance on and a relationship with God. If you have questions or would like prayer, visit calvaryaz.com forward slash connect and fill out a connect card. One of our pastors will reach out to you and pray with you this week. Well, that's all for today. Join us again next week. Bye-bye. Are you looking for a way to dive deeper into scripture and make it a part of your daily routine? Check out Calvary's Word for the Day daily devotional videos. Visit calvaryaz.com forward slash D-E-V-O and sign up to receive these three to five minute devotionals right to your inbox each day. Our team of pastors and leaders share meaningful insights from the Bible to equip and encourage you in your faith journey. Don't miss out on this opportunity to grow in your relationship with God and connect with the community of believers. Sign up today and start receiving your daily dose of scripture.